Hello, class. It is now <coughs> excuse me, 9 2 2020. Uh, RT 210. We are now going to pick up where we left off yesterday on with postural drainage. This is RT 210H live lecture. Um, we finished off yesterday with. Um, Finished off yesterday with aerosol and humidity. You guys have gotten all of the aerosol and humidity lecture. It's in the book. <clears throat> I do want to make a note. Uh, it was brought to my attention that, I mean, I'm sure you would have found it uh, with the index or whatever, but um, the syllabus has some chapters for this, which is alpha chapter. If you got the new book, you should be in chapter 44 and 39. And I think the old book is uh, 38 and 43 or something like that, but they're right next to each other. Um, <clears throat> just did your due diligence. You looked in the index for aerosol humidity or the contents and found it, okay? Um, so you should have been reading uh, the chapters. So as we go in today, we'll be coming from the new book, which is 40, chapter 44, Airway Clearance Therapy. Airway Clearance Therapy. This is when we got to, we have to figure out how to move those secretions out of the lung when cough is not enough. Okay, so when cough is not enough and doesn't seem like the patient is able to clear their secretions with a normal cough, then we have to come up with other reasons or other uh, <coughs> excuse me, other ways to make the cough more productive. Okay. And so the next thing we're going to talk about today will be postural drainage, uh, chest percussion therapy, and some devices, some actual devices that you can give the patient to use to help mobilize secretion. Okay, we're going to do the um, some of the PowerPoint today for postural drainage, and um, then we'll go all into the lesson plan and make sure everything is covered. And then after that, we'll go over to the lab to do this part of the lab. Okay, so it's very important that you guys be here live <clears throat> uh, in order to understand what the lab is going to be about. Okay, uh, if you don't, if you haven't read this part or haven't even looked at this part, then if you don't look at the lecture or you don't come to the lecture today, then when you get over to the lab, you're going to be totally lost. Okay, uh, you have got to stay uh, on point with this. You have to read your material. You have to uh, study the notes <clears throat> and be ready for everything that comes at you. All right? All right. <clears throat> We're going to start with the PowerPoint. And this is the PowerPoint that is simply um like the lesson plan right it's part of the lesson plan comes straight from the lesson plan all right all right so aerosol humidity let me start my slideshow from the current slide here we go now we're into postural drainage postural drainage is actually draining those segments that need to be drained okay uh remember that you guys have um, learn the segments of the lungs, where they are, and now you want to learn how to manipulate the body in order to drain those segments, okay? Uh, I usually liken this with uh, that little handheld game that you used to get for Christmas or a little gag game that a baby shower or whatever. Um, there's a little tray with a maze in it and there's a little metal ball in the maze, right? You have to move the little tray in order to make the ball go through the maze, right? Same thing with the body. Think about the lungs, okay? I want you to think about the lungs and the segments, where they're located. And that's going to tell you, okay, now how do I get that segment up in the air, okay? So this is my lungs, right? And this would be my left lung. This will be my left lung, your patient's left lung, and right lung, right? And so each lung has some lobes. And within those lobes, you have segments, right? And sometimes those secretions get tricky. 
they get thick and they get loculated and they're trapped in some of those actual lobes, I mean, uh, segments of the lobe, okay? And so you must know where those segments are located in order to drain it. Because what we're gonna try to do is get the segment up in the air, okay? Up in the air so that it will drain toward the larger airway, okay? If you have your lungs here, if you have some anterior segments, they need to be on their back, which is supine, right? And so that the, the um, segment will drain down into the middle of the lung to catch the larger airway, right? Okay, you have to be able to get into that larger airway, which is the trachea and the left and main, uh, right main stem bronchus. And then once it, the secretions make it to those larger airways, then the body has a trigger to cough, okay? So that's what we're gonna be doing. Now sometimes that's enough, sometimes that's not enough. Sometimes we have to actually do percussion on our patient. After we get them tilted the right way, right? We're letting gravity drain that segment, drain that thick mucus out of that segment. But sometimes it does not flow properly and we have to or do percussion, right? Chest percussion on the side of the patient, wherever it may be, and help that alone, all right? Sometimes that's not enough. Sometimes we have to actually give the patient a breathing device that will shake the lungs or allow air to get behind the secretion so that we can uh, achieve a positive call, okay? So you're just trying to get that segment up in the air. So you have to think about where that segment is, how can I get that segment up in the air so it can drain, right? So for instance, basics would be if you're trying to drain the left lung, which is just, just say lung it for right now. If I'm trying to drain the left lung, then I need to have that left lung up in the air, correct? So I need to be lateral. I will have to be on my right side so that my left lung is up in the air and gravity can drain that lung to the middle airways or the larger airways so you can cough them. So figure 44-1 uh, 40, in the uh, chapter 44 of airway clearance therapy. Airway clearance therapy, chapter 44 in this new book, right? Down at the bottom on here has the production of the cough and what happens with the cough, right? You want to learn that there's a difference between a strong call and a huff call, okay? You can, <coughs> that would be a call, right? But then there's also a technique called a huff call, and it's, <coughs> right? That will get the secretions from the lower airways. The huff call help mobilize secretions from the lower airways into the larger airways. And then once you get to the larger airways, we encourage the patient to cough hard. <coughs> and that will remove or expel those loculated secretions, okay? But first you have to get the uh, secretions mobile, all right? And so you're gonna learn some devices that would help shake up those secretions. And then you tell your patient, okay, give me a couple of huff coughs Like just look, that's all you're trying to do. And that kind of moves those secretions up a little bit. And then you make a strong cough. If you mobilize your secretions while they're still in the lower airways and then you cough hard, you just push them back down, okay? All you're gonna do is just push them back down and start all over again. So that is a proper breathing exercise and proper breathing techniques uh, that go along with the therapy, all right? Yesterday, we talked about um, the proper breathing pattern when inhaling aerosols, which is slow and deep with the inspiratory hold. Slow and deep with the inspiratory hold is key, okay? That will help best penetration and deposition of those aerosol particles. Now, why do we do aerosol therapy? We can be doing it for medication, or we could be doing it to mobilize secretion right? Or if we need to really moisten or humidify those airways uh, in the lungs. But if we 
are not breathing properly, then those aerosol particles slam into the back of the throat and they never penetrate deep enough into the tracheobronchial tree to be therapeutic, okay? So in this book, make sure you go over that. It talks about uh, the irritation, then you take, have to take an inspiration, and then there's a compression, and then there's expulsion, right? That's the, all of the phases of a cough, right? You don't just cough because you thought, oh, I think I need to cough today, right? Secretions, when they get into the larger airways, they trigger you, they tickle uh, your coughing reflex, right? And you have that irritation. Once you have that irritation, you must take a deep breath, right? In order to cough. You can't cough if you don't take a deep breath. If you just let all your air out and then cough, right? You can't really cough. You have to have a great vital capacity in order to produce a great cough. And remember, vital capacity is everything that you can do. So that is everything you can inhale and everything you can push out. So the coughing mechanism or the coughing maneuver is typically or basically a vital capacity, a forced vital capacity, okay, FDC. Deep breath in, <coughs> right, cough it out really, really well, okay? All right, so that's just something good for you to look at. Make sure you look at those words, those therapies, uh, all in your book. Again, you can't get everything from the lecture. A lot of it is going to come from the actual reading. All right, so posterior drainage. The indications or the reasons we do posterior drainage. Well, to mobilize accumulated secretions due to a couple of things. Some COPDers have uh, accumulated secretions. Uh, dehydration can make you accumulate secretions and acute pulmonary diseases. So different types of diseases in the lungs can cause you to retain secretions, right? And so that's why we would use it, okay? That's one of the indications. Another indication would be prophylactically, if they have a history of pulmonary problems. So if you know that Mr. Jackson, every winter he comes in full of stuff, right? He's always full, he's always had a little bit of pneumonia, uh, huffing and puffing, and he comes in, we do a little bronchial hygiene with him. We give him a little CPAP machine to help open him up. <clears throat> he coughs, we do a little cough assist or some flutter with him uh, and do some of those things like that. And then he'll, he will produce a good cough. Uh, we give him some medicine, make sure you take your medicine and it's the same thing every year. Well, if we know he's here, right? We can do what's called prophylactically. And you're gonna see that as well when we get to pharmacology. So make sure you know prophylactically what that means. Prophylactically means just, just because, right? We're gonna do it to kind of prevent something, right? Just do it because we know it helps in prevention. So condoms, with your age, this will be the best uh, analogy for me to use. Condoms, right? Condoms are also called prophylactics, right? Why do we use condoms? We use condoms to try to protect ourselves or prevent disease and pregnancy. So it's used prophylactically, okay? There's gonna be a medicine in pharmacology that you're gonna learn called chromalum sodium. You wanna see that again. Chromalum sodium is a uh, drug that we use for inhalation that's used prophylactically to treat asthma patients. So even if they're not having an asthma attack, we say take this prophylactically, take it once a day, twice a day, whatever the dosage is. Just take it every day just in case. That's what you call prophylactic. So if Mr. Johnson comes in and you know he's gonna come in every year he's sick, he comes in, we might do a little postural drainage just to make sure he doesn't have anything uh, trapped in those segments that would harm him later, okay? Because remember that word, exacerbation. Remember the word exacerbation means a, a flare-up of a certain disease, right? If you have COPD or you have asthma, if it's not bothering you, you still have it, right? <clears throat> but when things change or the seasons change and it flares it up, that's called an exacerbation, all right? Get your mind out the gutter. Because I know, Gabrielle, you're already looking crazy. All right. Uh, Position like that. Positions for each lung segment. All right, so now we have to know um, the segments 
and they're going to find out what the position is to drain those segments. So remember, you have to memorize these segments, okay? You're going to be asked these segments on your oral exam. They're going to pull a card and say, okay, tell me the segments of the right upper lobe. You're going to have to say, oh, that's apical, anterior, and posterior. Those are three segments in the right upper lobe, okay? So the three segments in the right upper lobe are, <clears throat> which is the right, right? This is the left, my left, and the patient's right. Don't forget that, not your left and right. So the right upper lobe, that's up in here, right? Right upper lobe is apical, right? Which will be at the top, anterior toward the front, and posterior back here toward the back of the right upper lobe. Then you have the right middle lobe, right? The right middle lobe would be right around in here, okay? You have the medial, which is toward the middle, and the lateral, which is toward the side, right? Then you have the right lower lobe down here, right lower lobe. First in the back is the superior. Don't forget that from the video we watched. You have a superior segment, which is in the back, right? Then you have anterior basal, lateral basal, posterior basal. Those are the segments of the right lung, upper, middle, and lower lobes, okay? And each one of those have a position in which to drain them, all right? Then you have the left upper lobe, left lung, right? It only has a left upper lobe and a left lower lobe, okay? That's all the left has. You know, it also has a little section we call the lingula, all right? But it's not a lobe. So, the left upper lobe, which is up in here, right? We have anterior, <clears throat> and we have apical posterior. We have superior lingula and inferior lingula. All right, that will be for the left upper lobe, because the left upper lobe is pretty large. I don't know if it has a fish lip. See, this one has a, you can see that line right here? That's the separation. So all it is is the left upper lobe, and then all this right here will be the left lower lobe, okay? Somebody's chatting me, let me see. Oh, okay. Let me, I have to stop share. <clears throat> Don't forget this is your left side, this is your right lung. So you have right upper lobe, right middle lobe, right lower lobe, and then you have a left upper lobe. See this line here? All this is left upper lobe, and then left lower lobe would be down here, okay? So, but I have to, have to put this back up so that I can show you, or we can talk about the lobes. All right, so the left upper lobe, <clears throat> we said has anterior, apical posterior, superior lingula, and inferior lingula. All of those segments are in the left upper lobe. Then you have the left lower lobe, which has the superior, just like the right. Both the left, the left lower lobe and the right lower lobe both have a superior segment, which is in the back. All right? Make sure you go back and look at McNally's video uh, in pulmonary anatomy, which talks about the lobes. That YouTube video of Dr. McNally was excellent, which showed you the uh, segmental bronchi how they go up into their perspective segments. And he talks about them, they're color coded. So you need to be looking at that. You're gonna be responsible for understanding where these lobes are, okay? Uh, you might not remember exactly where on the lung it is. You just need to know what segments are in which lobes, okay? And it's gonna pretty much tell you how to drain it. So then the left lower lobe has, again, the superior, anterior medial, lateral basal, and posterior basal. Okay. Now, I'm going to share the um, lesson plan so it tells you which, which way do we turn the patient, okay? Because they should have been on the power. I don't know why that wasn't there. But let me share the actual lesson plan. All right, here we go. I'm going to make it bigger. No Judas is blind. All right, so again, the right upper lobe has the apical, anterior, and posterior. 
So apical, to drain the apical segment of the right upper lobe, the patient needs to be in a semi-fowler's position at about 45 degrees. So that's about like this, right? Fowler's is sitting straight up. That's a high fowler. When I'm sitting straight up, that's high fowler's. Semi-fowler's is kind of just kind of cocked back about 45 degrees, okay? Notice how the way I'm laying, right, the apical segments will be at the top, right? And so they're kind of like, like this, and they're going to drain down, right? You want them to drain down into the larger airways. The anterior segment of the right upper lobe, you want to have the head of the bed flat and the patient supine. So now they're going to be completely level and flat, right? The whole bed is flat, okay? The bed is flat and the patient um, <clears throat> supine. Supine means on his back. Okay, if you can't remember supine, look how I'm holding this tray, right? You remember if somebody has food on this tray, if I'm serving you, right, somebody serving you food would be like this. When they walk around the restaurant like this, they're serving you, right? Well, serve and supine, right? Supine, serve. So think about that. They're on their back if they're supine. Then you have the posterior segment of the right upper lobe. Posterior, that means what? Oh, he's on his, um, he's on the posterior segment be toward the back. So you want the head of the bed flat, right? Now, patient will be one fourth higher from prone. So the head of the bed is flat, but they are what? Prone. Because the posterior segment will be in the back of the lung, right? The back of the right upper low. So he needs to be on his stomach in order to drain it. But not only is he prone, but they're saying that the uh, patient is one fourth higher from prone, the right side up. Okay, so look, this is his left, this is his right, right? So he's going to be, this is my hand is the right side, right? He's going to be on his stomach. Oh, well, he's going to be on his stomach, right? Prone, but the right side will be cocked up just a little bit, right? They're saying not only is he prone, but you're going to turn his right side just up just a little bit so your hips and everything will still be flush on the bed right you'll still be laying on your stomach but you're going to have your right side cocked up just a little bit so you'll have the patient laying there with the right side cooked up just a little bit and you'll probably cuss like that to drain that segment see that it's going to drain and slide them secretions right to the to the upper airway okay that's what we're trying to do all right now the right middle lobe, right middle lobe, that's the medial uh, segment and the lateral segments of the right middle lobe. So to, to drain the medial segment of the right middle lobe, you have the head of the bed will be down just a bit, 12 to 14 inches and right side up. So this is the left, this is the right. So you're gonna be down a little bit, but on his right side, right? So it makes sense, right? If I'm gonna drain my right lung, then I need to have the right side up in the air, right? I'm gonna be laying on my left with the right side up, okay? It's common sense. Then the lateral, the lateral segment of the right middle lobe, you're also gonna have the right side up, but the head of the bed down 16 to 18 inches, okay? So that lateral side, if I'm trying to do the lateral lobe, right? The lateral, I'm sorry, the lateral segment, of the right middle lobe, then this is my left, this is my right. So I'm gonna have my right side up, right? But I'm gonna have the head of the bed down, see that? So now that lateral segment of the right middle lobe can drain into the larger airway. Not just on the side, but we want it this way. So it drains down and toward the mouth, right? This is the mouth up here. So it's on his right side is up, Head of the bed down, 16 to 18 inches, right? Boom. So it can just slide right in. So you think about that ball, right? Trying to make that ball. What do you have to do to that tray to get that ball to drain down into the finish line? Okay? All right. Then we have the right lower low. Right lower low. So the right, this is my right. My right lower low has some segments as well. The right lower lobe, 
Okay. How do I position the segments of the right lower low? Okay. I don't know how it got like that. Let me go back. Yeah. Oh, here we go. All right. Superior segment of the right lower lobe, head of the bed flat, patient prone. Prone means on your stomach. So the head of bed is flat. You're not tilted or anything. You're flat, but you're on your stomach. That drains that superior segment. Remember, the superior segments are in the back. Both left and right both have superior segments right next to each other. Okay? Right lower low and left lower low both have a superior segment in the back. So to drain the superior segments of the lower lobes, you have to have the patient prone. Now, they can sometimes they also put some pillows up under the abdomen just to cock it up just a little bit. It helps cock the lungs up just a little bit. So think about yourself. If you're laying in your bed and you're laying flat, but you have a couple of pillows under your stomach, that will just cock you. You still be flat, but it cocks your midsection up just a little bit, right? Have your lungs cocked just a little bit so that can drain, okay? So that's the superior segments of both the right and the left lower lobe. What about the anterior basal segment of the right lower lobe, all right? Well, head of the bed down, 18 to 20 inches, patient supine. Remember, supine is on their back. So this would be how they are to drain the anterior basal segment of the right lower lobe. Okay? Lateral basal. Lateral basal. To drain the lateral basal segment of the right lower lobe, head of the bed down, 18 to 20 inches, patient laying right side up. Okay? So... Head of the bed is down. This is his, this is his right over here. So head of the bed is down 18 to 20 inches, and then on he has his right side up in the air. So not only are your head is your head down, but your right side is up in the air. That's how you drain the anterior basal segment of the right lower lobe. Lateral basal segment. The lateral basal segment will be head of the bed down 18 to 20 inches patient laying right side up. I might have just did that one, I'm sorry. But you got it twice. What about the posterior basal? Posterior basal. Well, this time you have the head of the bed down 18 to 20 inches, but the patient is prone. See that? Because posterior means the back, right? If I'm gonna drain the back of my lungs, I need to be on my stomach. And not only am I gonna be on my stomach, but I have to have the head of the bed down because the we're in, the, we're in the right lower lobe. We want it to drain up toward the upper airway, right? Okay. Now, left side. Left side, left lung, right? Left lung. This is my left lung over here. This is the left side, all right? Thing fell out earlier. This will be my left lung. So let's look at the left upper lobe. The anterior segment of the left upper lobe is same as the anterior on the right. Same thing. Fowler's right back just about 45 degrees. Same thing. That's the same way you drain. If I said, uh, Gabby, I need you to drain. We get an x-ray and we notice that there's uh, consolidation, right? You said consolidation is uh, a lot of something there, right? It's solid. Something's there. A lot of secretions, right? Mucus. And I said, Mr. Johnson has um, a lot of consolidated secretions in his apical posterior segment of his left upper lobe. Okay. Well, then, Gabby, you will say, okay, you go to his room and this is how you position him. The head of the bed up about 30 degrees, right? About, about like this, right? With the patient's left side up. One fourth or higher, prone. So you're gonna have the head of the bed up about 30 degrees, right? But you're gonna have the left side up one fourth or higher, prone. So you're kind of on your stomach, but not all the way, right? You're almost on your stomach, but you're not all the way. You got the left side up, but they want you to turn towards prone just about one fourth. So your left side is up. Right, and head of the bed is about 30 degrees, right? So you you like this. It's harder to do with this model. But if I'm like this, this is my left, this is my right. 
So I have to have my, I would have to be on my stomach. I would have to be this way, right? On the bed. I'll be like this with my left side almost prone. Okay? That's how you drain that segment. All right? Then you have the superior lingua, head of the bed down 12 to 14 inches, left side up, one fourth or higher supine. Right? Just the opposite. All right? What about the inferior lingua? Same as above, okay? The inferior lingual will be the same way as the superior lingual, all right? Then finally, the left lower lobe. The left lower lobe, which is this part down here, right? This part down here. Uh, they said left lower lobe. Uh, the superior segment, of course, is the same as the superior on the right, okay? Same thing. Anterior medial anterior medial segment of the left lower lobe is the same as the anterior basal on the right, okay? So that's good, some of them are the same, so you don't have to remember every single one, some of them are duplicates. The lateral basal segment of the left lower lobe, head of the bed down 18 to 20 inches, left side up. So this is my left side, so I have the head of the bed down 18 to 20 inches, left side up, right? That's it right there. That's the lateral basal. What about posterior basal? It's the same as the right posterior basal. Okay? Same thing. All right. Now, you will have to know that, guys. You'll have, and it's in the book. It's got some wonderful positions in the book, diagrams that show the positions of each segment, how you should be. Uh, matter of fact, in the new book on page 959, it has uh, all of the different positions. And there's actual pictures, okay? Actual pictures. Um, that is chapter 44 in the new book, and I think it's chapter 43 in the old book. So you want, if you're in the airway clearance therapy, that's the chapter, right? That's what we're talking about. Uh, that diagram in the new book is 44-2. I don't know what it is in the, in the old book, all right? But that is pictures of those segments, which you should have already been in. Okay, once we start a new segment, you are start reading and taking notes, right? Even if I haven't gotten to that yet, you should have already been reading. You only have a couple of days to read a couple of chapters, so you need to, you know, read it. You don't, don't wait on me to get to it before you read it. You have to be reading it, all right? So that's the posterior drainage. And how do we drain those segments? When we get an x-ray, the doctor will see that there's some secretion stuck in one of those segments. And that's how he or she will decide what to do, okay? So if you're looking at an x-ray and you're a respiratory therapist, you can look at the x-ray and say, oh, Mr. Mr. Uh, Smith has a lot of secretions in his lateral basal segment. It's around, you won't be able to see it definitively because it's an x-ray, but you can say, hey, that looks like right around the lateral basal section of his left lower lobe. You will know what to do. Let me put his head down left side up, and then we do some CPT, okay? This is CPT, it's kind of like doggy paddles. You cup your hands, right? The hands are cupped, and you do that, okay? And you're gonna see that as, as we go on. Now, like everything else we always say, there are some reasons why you don't wanna do drainage, okay? There are some reasons why we would not do posterior drainage, okay? Oh, and I'm trying to order you guys one of these these mass respiratory therapists. Uh, I'm trying to uh, order everybody one. I'm waiting on the, my invoice. Uh, respiratory care week's coming up next month. Uh, just like nurses week, they do food and they get you gifts and all that kind of stuff at the hospital in, in uh, October. All right? Uh, I'm not sure we'll be together in October. That's why I'm trying to get you guys one uh, now, okay? Now, contraindications. Contraindications to doing drainage. Why would we not do it? Well, the first reading is called an empyema. So say that to yourself. Empyema, not empire or empyema, right? Like somebody's name. That sounds like a name. Empyema. Empyema. I can see that right now. Please don't do that. All right. Now, empyema cannot be drained with postural drainage because it may spread. Empyema is like pus, infected pus in the lung. So if I know there's some infection there, 
I don't want to drain it to go past the rest of the lungs, right? Now it's going to infect everything it touches. So if it's an empyema, we don't want to mess with that, okay? We don't want to mess with that. Uh, flail chest. Flail chest is when you have two or more broken ribs in two or more places, all right? So say you got one rib that's broken two places and then another rib that's broke in two places. That's called flail chest, all right? It's painful and uh, you could harm the patient because if those bones poke into the lungs, then what? You have a pneumothorax, right? So we try to limit the motion and movement on them. You don't want to be beating on somebody with flail chest, broke ribs, okay? Also some wounds. If you have some stab wounds or bullet wounds or any kind of open wounds from a wreck or car crash, you don't want to be trying to position them, right? Because what if they have a, a, a major sacral wound, right? And you can stick your fist through it. Some people have wounds on their butt that you can stick your whole fist in it. That's how big it is, right? Well, they can't be on their butt. So you can't say, well, I need you to turn over on your supine to do this therapy. No, you can't do it, right? You can't do it. They may have to be prone the whole time they're in the hospital. They go from prone to side, prone to side, prone to side. They cannot go on their back. So wounds. Number four, spinal injuries. If somebody had a spinal injury, that's common sense. You don't want to be doing any turning, okay? You might make them paralyzed. Pneumothorax. If they have a pneumothorax, it just wouldn't help. You know, that's a hole in the lung, so draining is not going to help, so don't even waste your time. And then head injuries. Head injuries are important because when somebody has a traumatic brain injury, you want to reduce the amount of pressure on the head, okay? So what if you're standing upside down, like you used to do cartwheels or whatever, or you're laying, hanging off the bed when kids play like that. The blood rushes to the head, right? Well, not only the blood volume, but that volume represents a pressure. And so if I have the head of the bed down, I'm going to increase the pressure on that patient's head, which can be detrimental to his health, okay? Damage his brain, okay? So don't uh, head down with increase the intracranial pressure. Head being down will increase the intracranial pressure. So we wouldn't do that. Okay? Number seven. So there's, let me see, how many is it? 11. There's 11 reasons why we wouldn't do drainage. We just talked about the first six. Empyema, flail chest, wounds, spinal injuries, a pneumothorax, head injuries. Number seven, unstable cardiac status. If you have the head of the bed down, it may get worse, okay? You may make the pressure shoot up if you have them in Trendelenburg. Because remember, having the head of the bed down like that is called Trendelenburg, okay? That's Trendelenburg. If you have the head of the bed up and flat, that's reverse Trendelenburg, okay? And all of the beds have buttons to do these different things. I can put the bed in Trendelenburg. I can put it in reverse Trendelenburg, right? An up and down, Fowler's or not, right? and the rest you have to do with the patient yourself. COPD, now we said we do it for COPD, but it may not tolerate, they may not tolerate the head of the bed being down, okay? Some of them can, some of them can't. Uh, remember we talked about JVD, right? Was is juggler venous distension, right? Well, sometimes you lay a COPD or back flat, they can't breathe. Let me up, let me up, let me up, right? They can't take it. So if they are in that state, then you couldn't do it on them, right? What about obesity? If somebody is 700 pounds and has a 700 pound stomach, then you have to be careful putting them supine. You don't want that stomach laying on them, right? They can't be with their head of the bed down. That's too much pressure on the body. They can uh, suffocate like that. Same as pregnancy, right? Uh, uh, having a baby with twins, right? If you got, or a large baby, if she's nine months pregnant, eight months pregnant, you don't want to be trying to put the uh, lady's head down, okay? Head of the bed being down is diff uh, difficult for them. And you notice that a lot of these contraindications uh, are coupled with the head being down, see? Because when you get into hemodynamics, you want to learn that there's different pressures in the body. And when we have a, a patient with a low blood pressure or something like that, we'll put them in Trendelenburg to increase their blood pressure. So if you already have somebody with super high blood pressure, right, you don't want to put them in Trendelenburg. That's got to click in your head that, hey, I can't do that because this may make it worse, all right? 
And then finally, recent meals. If somebody just ate a big steak and potatoes dinner and here you come talking about, I need you to put you, your head of your bed down, right? Mm -mm, they might vomit on you, okay? So that's, those will be some in the, uh, contraindications for postural drainage. All right. Now, once we have decided to do the postural drainage and we have the patient in the position we want, right? We got them in the position that we want, all right? Well, the next thing will be percussion, just like drums. Percussion is clapping chest wall with cupped hands. You relax your wrist, you don't do this. You relax your wrist and you pop the chest, okay? That will help, uh, the vibrations will help loosen those secretions so that you can drain, right? Uh, they may be so thick and so uh, tenacious that they won't move. You have to help them out a little bit, right? Like you telling somebody to get on out the house or get on out the room, you might have to help them on alone, right? Well, that's what we're doing. We're trying to help them on alone, okay? So I'm gonna stop my share just for a minute so everybody can see the technique for uh, CPT. CPT, cupped hands, right? So say he has um, secretions, I'm doing some on his left lung, so it would be his chest skin right here. I would have my hands cupped like this and I like playing the bongo, right? You have to make a noise. It's not a, okay, let me, let me, Mr. Johnson, turn right here, let me, let me. Let me do that right. Let me get that right there. No, it has to be percussion. Okay? People that are around in the nursing station should hear you doing it. All right? They should hear you doing it. Telemetry should see uh, something going on with the heartbeat, right? Because you're hitting those electrodes, right? And making them do all, what's going on in there? Oh, that's uh, respiratory doing CPT. And that, that way they know you did your therapy, okay? So whatever position they need to be in, whether they uh, have their left side up and you're doing it, or if they have to be prone and you're doing it on their back, right? Whatever you need to be done, that is what percussion is, okay? Percussion. That's how we do percussion, just like drumming. All right. So what are the indications for percussion? Well, when it's difficult to move the secretion, they won't move, right? You tried a little aerosol, that didn't get them up. Uh, you tried a little drainage, that didn't get it up. So now let's hit it, all right? Let's do a little percussion, CPT, chest physiotherapy or chest percussion therapy. Pretty much the same thing uh, to help to move those secretions. When postural drainage alone is not effective, okay? Again, there are some contraindications for this, which is pretty much almost the same. Again, you have empyema. You don't want to be beating on the impact, uh, the secretions of the empyema, making it move, right? And spread infection. Flail chest. Makes sense that if somebody has several broken ribs, you're not going to go in there and start beating on them, okay? Uh, wounds. You don't want to be hitting over a, a, a nice and tender wound. Frank homoptosis. Does anybody remember what Frank homoptosis means? What is homoptosis? We talked about homoptosis. We talked about what it was. What is homoptosis? You can say it out loud or you can put it in the chat. You need to know what homoptosis is. And we talked about it. What is homoptosis? All right, homoptosis is bleeding from the mouth, coughing up blood. When your patient has bright red blood, that's called frank homoptosis. Frank means bright red blood. If you cough up a little dark blood, that's not frank homoptosis, that's homoptosis. If it's dark, that means it's kind of old, right? Or it came from a long way away, and by the time it got to your mouth, it was old, all right? But frank homoptosis is fresh red blood. Something is bleeding right now, okay? And so if somebody's coughing up bright red blood, that's frank homoptosis, you would not do 
CPT. Uh, what about their own anticoagulant therapy? All right, so put it in the chat what you think anticoagulant therapy is. What is anticoagulant therapy? Think about the word anticoagulant. What does that mean? Put it in the chat. Gabby, Judith, and Rayana, can you tell me what, what that means? What does it mean to be uh, anticoagulant? If somebody is on anticoagulant drugs, what kind of drugs are they? Are you with me? Is anybody here right now? Can you hear me, Gabby, Judith, and Rayana? Can y'all hear me? Are y'all here or y'all stepped away? Okay, Rayana, okay. Judith, all right. Y'all can say them out loud. You don't have to. There's only three of y'all here, so you can say it out loud. Coagulant therapy, anticoagulant. Coagulant means blood thinner. Uh, anticoagulant would be a blood thinner, somebody that's on heparin or some type of warfarin or some type of blood thinner, okay? You don't want to be hitting on them because if their blood is thin, they're going to bruise really easy, right? So somebody who has thin blood will bruise really easy, okay? So uh, sometimes people's blood is too thick, and so we have to give them heparin or warfarin, which will thin the blood out some, reduce the clots, right? If they have a lot of blood clots and PEs and thrombrosis and all of that, uh, we will give them what's called anticoagulant therapy, right? Especially if they've had a stroke, uh, uh, a brain stroke, right? We give them some blood thinners. So if they have blood thinners, you start beating on them, they're going to bruise really easy, okay? Number six, pain. If they just can't take it, right? You, they hurting where you hit and I can't take it, so stop, all right? TB, what's TB? What is TB? Tuberculosis. Tuberculosis, thank you. If somebody has tuberculosis, you don't want to do CPT because it may spread. Tuberculosis is a disease that could be defined or confined to one spot, right? But if you get the hitting on it and then they get the coughing it up, then what, what happens? You're going to catch it, right? Tuberculosis is a very contagious airborne disease. It's airborne. That means if they breathe it or they cough or laugh in your face and you inhale, you're going to have it. doesn't even have to be what you can see. It doesn't have to be droplets. It doesn't have to be a mist, a sneeze. It's simply airborne. If you walk into the room, tuberculosis is in the room if you have, if a patient has it. So of course, you don't want to be in there hitting on them, making that stuff move around, and then they get the coughing and you don't have the proper mask on, then you're gonna have tuberculosis, okay? And then metastasize cancer, right? If they have cancer, like lung cancer, and it's spreading, right? You don't wanna hit on that, and that just helps the spread, right? You're just helping the spread of the cancer. Metastasize means spread it, right? When somebody has metastasized cancer, that means a cancer that started in one spot, but spread to another. It metastasized to another. Right? You guys have to get, uh, make sure you're strong on those vocabulary words. All right? All right. Let's take a 10 minute break. Mr. McCarthy. Yes. Um, can you tell me what my grade is? Yeah, I'll tell you that after class. Okay. All right. We're going to take, because I, I have to upload all of that to it. Okay. All right. So well, we're going to pause the recording now and take a break. A minute break. <laughs> Uh, and continue on with percussion, the technique. It is 50 after, come back at two o'clock. So right, we can finish this up and I hope to see you guys for lab at three. All right, we are back, it is now two o'clock. We're gonna continue on with uh, the, the rest of the postural drainage. And then I'm gonna pull up a PowerPoint presentation of the devices the devices that you'll be using also for airway clearance, okay? All right, let me share my screen.
All right, so technique, the technique for percussion, all right? I already said it is cupped hands, right? Cupped hands, and you do it with a relaxed wrist, right? It's not to slap. It doesn't slap, but it makes a cupping sound, okay? It will make a cupping sound if you do it correctly. And it's strong enough to, you know, mobilize the person, not trying to really hurt them. Uh, but you do have to do it hard enough for it to be worth something, right? You can't just go in there and just touching on That's not going to work, all right? Uh, so the technique, you want to avoid the sternum, the spine, and other bony structures, right? You don't want to be uh, hitting on somebody's sternum, right? Uh, their spine or other bony structures in their body. Uh, you may use a sheet or a towel to avoid the slapping sound, right? So sometimes you can get a, a, a towel, one of those little hospital towels, and fold them up, lay it on the patient, and then you can, it's a sound like that. Not, not a slap, it's a, hear that? That's how it should sound. You want to make sure you examine the skin for any effect, because you have some older patients, right? You do have some older patients who um, skin can tear really, really easy especially Caucasian patients. Their skin gets real, real thin. It's paper bag thin. And sometimes if you're hitting too hard, you may split or crack their skin and it can be very painful. So you gotta make sure you examine the skin. And each segment you do for about three to five minutes. So if they got a couple of segments that you're doing, you do one for about three to five minutes and do another one for about, so the whole thing is used around 10 minutes, okay? Vibrations. Now, when you get done with percussion, you can add what's called vibrations to it, all right? Which you'll be shown in lab more effectively, harder to show in, in person, okay? But it may be used in conjunction with percussion or alone. So how do you do vibrations? You tense your arms, right? Tense your arms and keep them straight and you shake from the shoulder when the patient exhales. So after I do my percussion, right? Do my percussion, I will put my hands on the patient, lock my arms, right? And then I tell them to take a deep breath in, and when they exhale, I shake from the shoulders, right? You kind of just shake. You don't shake with the, like that, but you use your whole body to like a jackhammer, right? And you shake. And that's called vibration. That helps also helps move them on out of that segment because you cannot you can't understand. You, I've sent those pictures of some of the secretions coming out of people's traits. That's five times worse inside. Okay, so if it looked nasty on the outside, just imagine what it is inside that segment. And they are struggling to breathe. They're struggling to maintain oxygenation and to feel like they can breathe with that stuff in there. So you are really helping them because don't forget the feeling of not being able to breathe. Most of us don't even know what that's like. Some people may, right? So you have to do all of these therapies and all these tricks of the trade in order to mobilize those secretions, okay? So you have drainage, percussion, vibration, right? With your own self, right? All right, now indications for the vibrations. After each segment with percussion, it helps to move secretions into the larger airways, uh, or you can do it by itself when percussion is not tolerated. So you know you can't hit on them because it hurts them or skin tearing or whatever the reason why you couldn't actually do the percussion, then you could probably just do the vibration instead and just help out. When they take a deep breath, you vibrate as they exhale. Not when they're inhaling, but as they're exhaling, okay? Now, if that doesn't work, we can start going to our machines now, okay? We can start going to our devices and our machines, okay? And one of them is called a mechanical percussor or vibrator, okay? It's a mechanical percussor. It has a it is pneumatically powered. Some of them are pneumatically powered, some of them are electrical powered. Uh, but you use it only to the lung area. You must avoid the kidneys and the heart and stuff like that. You don't wanna have those mechanical percussors on the kidney. You can hurt somebody's kidney like that, okay? But you're only on those lung areas. You can use it uh, in the book. It has a good pay, uh, picture of one uh, here. This one here is in your book. That's a picture of a mechanical percussor or vibrate. It vibrates really, really, really strong, almost so strongly that it's hard to hold, okay? It's hard to keep hold of it in your hand, 
all right? Um, <clears throat> but they help. They help shake those secretions out of the actual uh, um, segment, right? Now, of course, you want to avoid bony structures. You don't want to be hammering on somebody's elbow or somebody's uh, spine or sternum, okay? If it's hurting, move. Of course, if you're a male, you want to avoid breast tissue in females. Not only because it's the breast, but if you're a male, they can easily say that you tried to batter them or he was touching my breast and all that. You, you have to use a good technique. If they have the breast there, you just go under the breast with your arm, right, if you have to, and then percuss under that. Okay? So avoid the tissue because the tissue can be sensitive. All right? You can use a towel or a sheet to prevent the slapping sound and... Um, we use electrical uh, precautions as well. So if you do have a percussor, manual percussor, or mechanical uh, or vibrator, if, if it uses electricity, then you use common sense as you would anything else that's electrical. Don't use it around water. Don't patients in the shower. Here you are at the, at the shower door with a percussor plugged up, talking about, oh, I need to get this percussor right quick, right? Of course not. If they're taking a bed bath and there's water in the bed with them, then you wait, right? You do that at a different time. And also avoid a hazardous gas environment. If there's a really strong oxygen environment, so I don't know why it would, where it would be, but you won't wanna start anything sparking, right? Any kind of electrical spark or plug, just like they say, you don't use your cell phone or anything like that around the gas pump, okay? Any kind of spark could cause a explosion, okay? All right, now at this time, I'm going to show you the PowerPoint that talks with these other therapies. Now we're gonna get into the actual handheld things that the patient can use in order to facilitate uh, a better cough and move those secretions, okay? So I'm gonna do, do a new share for the actual PowerPoint of the devices. All right, slideshow. All right, so here goes some of the pulmonary clearance devices. Okay, pulmonary clearance devices. All right, positive expiratory pressure, which is PEP therapy, right? PEP, P E P, positive expiratory pressure. So what happens is uh, they blow into a device and it gives them back pressure, okay? Application of positive pressure, uh, 10 to 15 centimeters of water doing exhalation. So they take a deep breath in and then they blow into the PEP device, okay? So look at A, it says patient inspire, inspires a, lot, a volume greater than tidal volume, right? Nice deep breath, uh, but not actually total lung capacity. You don't have to go deep as you can do it. Just take a nice deep breath and then you exhale to the FRC, okay? That means you blow out, blow out far as you can blow. That's your FRC, okay? You get to your FRC, because you can't get to the RV, right? Now, how many times do they do it? 10 to 20 times, uh, followed by three huff coughs. So they take the PEP device, which you'll see in lab, take a deep breath in, and then blow out to FRC. You don't have to force it. Just blow out to FRC, right? and do that 10 to 20 times, and then you tell them to huff cough, which is <laughs> like that. That gets that stuff out from in the lower airways, okay? You do that five to 10 times per session, okay? You can do it simultaneously with a nebulizer treatment. Remember I said, as a therapist, we can look in our toolbox and we can put a breathing treatment in line, so when they inhale the breathing treatment, they get in the medicine and then they exhale and they exhale and getting that positive pressure. So you're doing two stones at one uh, with that modality, okay? Indications to aid in removal of retained secretions, atelectasis, and routine treatment of cystic fibrosis patients, all right? We wanna do it and use it to aid in the removal of those blocked up secretions or if they have a lot of atelectasis. Some patients uh, use this for atelectasis. If they have a lot of atelectasis and then they take a deep breath in, blow into it, and that back pressure can help pop open some of those closed alveoli, right? In your cystic fibrosis patients, well, we'll learn more when we get to uh, J, uh, when we talk about restrictive and obstructive diseases, okay? Um, uh, 
that's something they use every day, all day long. Every day, all day long. Okay. All right. Hazards. Uh, risk of barrel trauma. Barrel trauma means damage to the lung. Not necessarily a pneumothorax yet, but damage or or kind of tearing a little bit, kind of um, stretching a little too far, right? That can call, that's called barrel trauma, right? And then hemodynamic compromise. Remember, hemodynamics is simply pressures. You got several different pressures in the heart. You have several different pressures in your arteries and veins, in your head, right? All of this. And when you're doing positive expiratory pressure, you're adding pressure. So you always have to be mindful of their hemodynamic status when you do anything that introduces more pressure to the body. Because what are we saying? Introduce uh, pressure, positive pressure inside the thoracic cavity will decrease venous return, right? So that makes the blood that's going to the heart less, right? And also it will, if it decreases the venous return to the heart, then it's going to decrease the output of the heart, okay? And volume and pressure are hand in hand. The more volume you have, the more pressure you have. The less volume, the less pressure, okay? You'll see that more again, like I said, when we get into um, um, J, okay? All right. Uh, let me see. Yeah, hazards. All right. That's the hazards. Let me go on. All right, flutter valve. The flutter valve is similar to positive expiratory pressure. The flutter valve has a weighted ball that rises and falls with each breath. This action opens and closes the valve. So when you breathe into it, there's a middle ball that goes up and down and that intermittent up and down is what shake the lungs. So it's that shaking every time you exhale, that ball rises and falls. When it falls, it stops the pressure. And so it's open and close, open and close, right? And that makes your lungs shake, 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 shake. Shake, 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 shake. Just by using the device. It's, it's really cool, really cool. Uh, alternating the opening and closing of the valve causes pressure pulses to be transmitted to the lung parenchyma. Remember the parenchyma is where the magic happens. That's what we want. Because a lot of times those secretions get way down into the, um, parenchyma area and we got to make sure we clear that area because that's where the magic happens if we don't clear that area the magic cannot what happen and that's why you have poor gas exchange poor saturations and high co2s right so it's a domino effect we have to keep those lungs clear and open all right so it has the same indications for pep same hazards as pep all right then the chest vest High frequency chest wall oscillation. It's uh, HFCWO. HFCWO. You'll see that. You're like, well, what is that? I didn't know what that was. You didn't tell us what that was. I'm telling you what it is, and it's in your reading. HFCWOT. That's high frequency chest wall oscillation, also known as the chest vest. Now this is a pneumatically powered vest that the patient can put on, zip it up or strap it up, however it's made. It has two uh, hoses that come off of it. They go to the machine. It connects to an air pulse generator. That generator rapidly inflates and deflates the vest 10 to 20 times per second. So it's a shh. You put it on and you can just, it just shakes the whole chest, right? All of the chest is, is shaking, okay? Indications would be mucus plugging, retained secretions like everything else, treatment in cystic fibrosis. The cystic fibrosis patient has a lot of different treatments they have to take on a daily basis, okay, on a daily basis. Some of the hazards, uh, unstable chest fractures may cause a pneumothorax. So if I have that vest on you and it swells up like a blood pressure cuff, right, and then it shakes. Well, if you have a lung or a rib fracture and it inflates and shake pops and turns that rib and it goes into your lung that could cause a pneumothorax 
So of course I wouldn't do that on somebody who has chest fractures, right? But that's the chest vest. And I'm gonna show you some pictures of these. All right, so this is that flutter I was telling you about. Flutter type one. This is the first type of flutter that has a metal ball inside of here. The patient will exhale through here and that little ball will shake back and forth, which gives a pulsating sensation in the lungs. Helps shake those secretions off the lungs. That is the flutter device, device type one. Then we have the flutter device type two known as the acapella. This is known as the acapella. Instead of having a ball in the middle, it has little valves inside of there. And you see this plus sign and an arrow? You can make it stronger or you can make it less strong depending on the patient's needs, right? The stronger it is, the more shake they get. The less strong, the less shake that they get. They put their mouth on this end here, they take a deep breath in and blow through here. When they blow through there, those little valves will open and close, open and close, open and close, open and close really fast. That open and closing will also give a shaking effect to the lungs. That's the acapella device. All right, this is just a diagram of that flutter type one that has that metal ball in there. Hold on, somebody's chat me. Can't get to it. Mr. McCarthy. Yes. How many pages sign offs is it on the lab today? A couple. Huh? All the ones we didn't do yesterday. We did two yesterday, so today is what? Two more? Two or three. All right. This ball here is that weighted ball here. As you exhale through there, that ball lifts and closes, lifts and closes, and that gives you that back pressure. So just a little quick diagram of the flutter device. All right, now this is the PEP device we talked about. There is no flutter with this. It's just one back pressure. This is the PEP device. You put your mouth on here, and you will blow through there. Now notice the pressure right here. See how it says centimeters of water? These are the pressures here. You can turn this little dial up top and it will move this red line up and down to the desired pressure. If I want 15, I turn this dial down to 15, right? If I only want five, then I turn the dial and make this go back up to five, right? The less pressure, the less effective, all right? Less pressure, the less effective. That's the PEP device. All right, again, PEP is a form of bronchial hygiene. It's one of the three adjuncts of positive airway pressure. Uh, PEP involves active expiration through a one-way valve against a variable flow sensor, right? In modern PEP devices, flow resistance can be manipulated to adjust for a desired pressure. This is just another uh, for you to go over to remind you guys of the patient positioning, right? This is prone. Laying on your stomach is prone. Laying on your back, supine. Right side, right lateral recumbent, that means you have your uh, right side up, right? Patient's laying there, that, well that's the, laying on your right side, I'm sorry. Right lateral recumbent is laying on your right side. That is the patient's right side right here. Fowler's. Sitting up, see, Fowler's is sitting up. Left lateral recumbent was laying on the left side. And then Trendelenburg is when the feet are higher than the head. That is Trendelenburg, okay, Trendelenburg. This is another uh, diagram here of kind of helps you with the lobes. Uh, this is in the book, okay, this is in the book but kind of shows you some things here. Those upper lobes, like the apical segments, right, will be uh, Fowler's or leaning forward in Fowler's, right? Uh, anterior segments, you have your right and left. The bed of the head of the bed is flat. Everything is flat. Then your posterior segments, see, you might be prone. This patient is prone here with the head of the bed up just a little bit. And over here, uh, the head of the bed is completely flat, but they are prone, okay? Then your lingual, uh, and then you have your basal segments, 
stay there in Trendelenburg and some of them are on the side. And you don't have to have their arm a certain way. You don't have to put it up. You just try to make the patient comfortable, okay? The basic thing you need to know is what's in the um, lesson plan. Those positions for each segment in the lesson plan that we've gone over is what you need to know, okay? That's what you need to know, the lesson plan. So if it tells you one fourth turn supine, one fourth turn prone, stuff like that, that's what you need to know, okay? This is just another diagram of, it's kind of like a common sense, gives you a, uh, at least a basic view, right? A basic view of which way you're gonna be trying to lay a patient in order to drain them. Again, this is just another picture there that's available for you to study for the exam, right? See how this pillow, you can put the pillow under the waist if you need to, uh, under the legs, just to try to make your patient comfortable, okay? Trying to make your patient comfortable. Now, this is that manual percussor here. Uh, this one plugs up, this looks like this plugs up to actually uh, electricity, but this part here will go up and down. This white piece here is like a, like a drum. It, da, 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 that percusses. Then you have this vibrator over here that kind of vibrates really, really strong to help move those secretions. So these will be your manual percussor or vibrators. All right, this is just showing you again how the hand should look when we do CPT. It's not a slap, it's a cupped shaped uh, hand. Oh, my bad. Oh yeah, okay, we're done with that. All right, this is the chest vest. This is the chest vest. You had an older model here and a newer model here. This is a more newer model, but you see how it's a vest. You put the vest on, you put the uh, tubing on and you cut it on. You can control the frequency and you can control the time and the pressure of it, okay? You do it all to uh, aid in the comfort for your patient, okay? And see it again, HFCWO. If you say, what is that? And I don't know what that is. I never heard that. Yes, you have. That's the high flow chest wall oscillation device, okay? You guys can, when you come to lab, you'll be able to put that on and feel it today. All right, so those are the airway clearance devices. We've gone over aerosol and humidity. Uh, you now I'm going to stop the recording for now and give you it's 2.25. Lab starts at three. So you need to be on your way here to the lab um, to knock that out, okay? You'll be going over all of the drainage, percussion, and those devices with Mr. Boyd. He'll be over there explaining it to you, showing it to you, uh, and checking you off on it, okay? Then tomorrow we will have a, a review, right? Tomorrow we'll be a review for the whole day. We're gonna review all of it, okay? All right, I'm gonna pause the recording at this time. And- Mr. McCarthy. Yes. Is the exam Friday or Monday? I'll let you know, uh, let me look at my, my syllabus. Okay. I'll let you know, and all that kind of stuff will be put in your announcement, okay? Okay. In your announcement or in your email. And if you have any questions about your grade, you can you can come up here or you can uh, catch me after class and I can go over with you to show you what you need to make to pass, okay? But what you asked me is not, not necessarily true, okay? So I have to look at it and show you. It's hard to explain in the middle of a lecture, okay? Okay, so, but with... Uh... Homework average included, that's what my girl.